Ghrelin is really an interesting hormone, and it is it it is it is secreted from the stomach, mostly stomach and part of the small intestine, and it goes to the brain, and then it says to the brain, "Okay, you better eat. You're hungry." So it is that hormone that makes us feel hungry, and mm. so when we eat, typically our ghrelin levels go down. And, and we'll talk about this a little later. Sometimes our food composition, what we eat in a typical meal impacts our ghrelin levels differently. So, uh, so when we eat, typically our ghrelin levels go down and it says, okay, now you're full and you can stop eating. And so one of the re- reasons people always say, don't eat too fast, or if you're hungry, take a few minutes to, you know, make sure you still want to get seconds is just to give the body time for that, um, for the hormones to shift. So, and for that, you know, ghrelin level to go down. So um, the other reason we know a lot about ghrelin is because when Mm. people lose weight, they often feel more hungry. And, um, and, and I always Mm. explain this to my patients, you know, I'm like, you know, they, they, they need to and want to lose weight. And, um, and when they do, sometimes they feel more hungry for a period of time. And I think that's a really natural, normal thing. And we sometimes have to work through that to continue to get to our goal if we're working to lose weight. So we've got a lot of hormones that, that have an influence on what we choose to eat and when we choose to eat. Yeah, it's, it's so critical because if we, don't, if we don't understand how those are regulated, it's really a big deal. And I think, um, you know, when, when you're not eating and when you're losing weight and when you're we haven't eaten for a while your body will naturally produce this hormone in your stomach that makes you hungry which is a good thing uh so we don't we don't starve to death right (laughs) right and so you know it goes down if you eat and you know and so forth but um if you have um a diet that's causing um a dysregulation of that hormones um uh, it can really create a problem. And I think, you know, we mentioned the microbiome, which also is key, but so, so tell us about how, how, uh, from a lifestyle perspective, we're, we're affecting ghrelin and what we can do with our diet, with our timing of eating, with sleep and other factors that are really driving a lot of issues. Yeah. One of the things we know is when we have a meal that has sufficient amount of protein in it, that our ghrelin levels decrease and we feel less hungry with that type of a meal. So it's really important. You know, we, we've talked a lot about how insulin can, can trigger mm-hmm. hunger too, right? But ghrelin also. So when we eat a meal that's balanced, that has sufficient protein and fat, along with all the good healthy carbohydrates, that helps with making us feel more full and not as hungry. So it's really important to think about each of your meals in your day and say, okay, did I have sufficient protein there? And remember, protein is like your uh, your eggs and fish and chicken and beef and beans and legumes mm-hmm, and nuts mm-hmm. and seeds. And that protein will help when you consume it, help that ghrelin go down and make you feel more satiated after a mm-hmm. meal. And, and ghrelin is one of those reasons that that occurs. Hmm. Um, You mentioned also with lifestyle, uh, sleep. Sleep is critical. When people are sleep deprived, ghrelin levels go up and they're more hungry. And so we're seeing an epidemic of sleep deprivation in in this country um, and um, worldwide even, right? So we're seeing this epidemic of sleep deprivation, which is one thing that's driving higher levels of ghrelin. And we want to make sure that we're getting adequate sleep. If somebody has a this is process called sleep apnea. If somebody has interrupted sleep where they are, um, they're having episodes where they're not getting oxygen into the body. That's what sleep apnea is. They're having episodes mm-hmm. where either the, uh, they're, they're somewhere in their, uh, their, their nasal area, their, the back of their throat that's preventing oxygen from getting into the body. Then the body uh, has to wake itself up to take a deep breath. So people will often be snoring and then will stop breathing for a period of time and then take this really big deep breath. Um, they might not even realize they're having these episodes of, of apnea or not getting oxygen into the body. But what we're learning is that when you have sleep apnea, ghrelin levels are higher. So people who have sleep apnea have higher levels of ghrelin and again, one reason why that drives this vicious cycle of weight gain, obesity, weight gain, obesity, fatigue, um, hunger, 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 right? So it drives this vicious cycle. They know that when people are have sleep apnea, 
their levels of ghrelin are higher than the same uh, group of people that even have the same body weight. So even Mm -hmm. if both Mm -hmm. groups are overweight or obese, if you have sleep apnea, your level of ghrelin will be higher. And so it's really important that we pay attention to the sleep, work with our patients and find out, um, you know, are they getting adequate sleep, first of all, and, you know, adequate hours of sleep, that is, and of the hours of sleep that they're getting, are they restful? Are they are they sufficient? Is there any concern about apnea or something that would be disrupting their sleep? But you know, Liz, it's it's, it's really true that you know sleep apnea is a big factor. And I, I remember a patient I had who was a lawyer and uh, telling me about his struggle to lose weight, and he needed to lose about fifty pounds. He says, "Nothing you could do about it." I said, "Well, tell me about your life. What do you do?" He said, "Well, I'm a lawyer." I'm like, "What do you do? I'm going to do this and that." I'm like, but I have to stand up on my desk every day to to work. Otherwise, I fall asleep at my desk. I'm like. Oh, well, maybe you have sleep apnea. So we tested him. He had severe sleep apnea. We put him on a CPAP machine and he lost 50 pounds like that. And I think, you know, most people don't understand the connection between sleep, but it's not just sleep apnea if you're not getting enough sleep. And you and I both as doctors know that when we are on call and we're working all night or we don't sleep, that we tend to crave more food. We crave carbs, we crave sugar, and our appetite's so screwed up. And I remember this one study, it was healthy young 20 year olds who weren't overweight who were sleep deprived on purpose compared to a control group. And they found that the sleep deprived group were much hungrier and they were craving more carbs and sugar. So that's an interesting phenomenon. That's why we see such an incredible consumption in this country of these products who are sleep deprived as a nation and we have poor quality sleep. And you know, there's 70 million people that suffer from some type of sleep issue, which is a lot of people. I think maybe even more actually. Yeah. <laughs> it's, a, it's a lot of people. Uh, and, and so it's there's not a lot just of sleep apnea but it's all the sleep deprivation. What about other foods like protein and fiber and fat? How do those affect ghrelin? Right. Well, they'll, they'll trigger ghrelin levels to go down after you consume them. So it's really important. You know, we work with all of our patients to say at every meal, each meal you have, make sure you've got a good source of protein, a good source of fiber, which is all your vegetables and beans, legumes, nuts and seeds, ground flaxseed, and healthy fat at every meal, because that's going to help you feel more satiated, it's going to help those ghrelin levels go down. I mean, we also know things like cannabis, right, can cause ghrelin to increase. And and that mm-hmm. may be why people get the munchies, right? And so it's important to understand yeah. what things you're doing and how they're impacting your hunger in your body. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that's right. I and mean, I think, you know, obviously people smoke pot and they get the munchies for sure. And that drives appetite. Um, so, how do we work with people who have these problems? How do we sort of help? And by the way, you know, one of the things that I wanted to sort of mention was was sort of the theory about gastric bypass. One of the theories about gastric bypass is that since ghrelin is produced in the stomach, that when you have a gastric bypass, it shuts down the ghrelin levels. But I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure if that's the only the only thing that's going on. And and I think the reason I say that is it was a recent randomized controlled trial comparing people who had gastric bypass with those who were matched to them but who didn't have a bypass, but just went on the bypass diet. And they both Ooh. lost the same amount of weight. Now, I don't know what their appetites were like or if there was a difference, but they basically went and lost the same amount of weight. So I'm being very curious actually to look at the fine print of that study to see if the people who didn't have the bypass were hungry or they just starved them and lost weight or if it was that they actually cut down their diet and they actually were able to accommodate to a lower caloric intake. Yeah, I think it's really important what you just said is that um, – um, and prior, actually, prior to working with you at both uh, Canyon Ranch and the Ultra Wellness Center, I worked in a practice where we worked with surgeons who were doing gastric bypass surgery. So I saw a lot of patients who who were going through the surgery, and I saw a lot of the side effects and the negative side effects of the surgery mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. as well. And 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 what I think is what you mentioned is really so critical to understand is that when we can help people get off of this vicious cycle of hunger and eating and hunger and eating and hunger and eating, when we can help them break that cycle, they can be successful at getting to where they want to be in terms of, of their intake of food. So, so you're right. Maybe at the beginning, uh, when for, the, for that group of patients who didn't have the surgery, it, that first couple of weeks may have been really hard of saying, okay, I'm going to really cut back on the amount of calories, the types of calories that I'm eating, the balance of my nutrients. And and they might have felt really hungry for those first couple of weeks, but we see this all the time. Once people get through that time, they start to feel better. They don't have those Mm -hmm. that hunger anymore, that drive to constantly eat and snack and 
choose unhealthy foods, and then they they can kind of uh, start to be successful. You know, um, the the surgery prevents you know makes you know makes it so you can't eat for those first few weeks, and then that just uh, uh, spirals right. into yeah. But then, of course, you're dealing with all the side effects of, of the surgery, unfortunately. So, um, you know, th- that is an interesting thing that we see. You're right. Fascinating. Uh, and, and the you know, you've seen patients with this and you've had, you know, I remember many patients who have struggled with this and you get their numbers dialed in and you kind of sort through everything with them and they, they do so much better. So can you tell us about this patient as a 45 year old guy who was like hungry all the time, was overweight and struggling with this sort of appetite and hunger? Yeah, you know, I mean, so he came to see me and he was, he was really um, trying to be healthier. I mean, he was working hard to be healthier um, um, and really frustrated that he couldn't get his weight to where he wanted it to be. And he had uh, gained 25 pounds over the last couple of years. He was feeling hungry all the time. Mm. He didn't have the same level of vibrancy anymore. He, mm. he was just feeling kind of sluggish and low energy. He, um, you know, we noted when we did his vitals and his physical exam that he had really gained a lot of weight around his abdomen, around his belly, right? That visceral adiposity, that belly Mm -hmm. fat that's really causes a lot of inflammation in the body, causes high levels of insulin and, you know, Mm -hmm. is associated with all of those negative things like heart disease and stroke and cancer. So he had gained a lot of weight around his belly. His waist to hip ratio was, um, was, uh, one, um, which is higher than it should be. And, you know, mm. you know, when you look at his diet, he was trying to uh, be healthier, but he was grabbing coffee drink for breakfast. You know, at lunch, he was having orange juice. He had switched that out instead of soda, a sandwich and right. chips. You know, he, he did have a few beers at dinner, you know, um, yeah, he, yeah. you know, and then maybe snacked on crackers and popcorn after dinner. And, and, um, you know, so he was trying, he felt like he was trying to make the healthier food choices. But we saw a lot of issues when we really delved deeper in terms of his diet, where we needed to do some work. And we also, when we got his full history, realized, you know, that he was a snorer. So he was, uh, wow. you know, he was, he was snoring frequently. Um, and, you know, we talked about how snoring can be a sign that you may have sleep apnea. I mean, there's lots sleep of other apnea. signs too. High blood pressure, weight gain, fatigue, you know, falling asleep during the day or when you don't want to fall asleep. Um, um, so, so, but because of all this, I really encouraged him to get a sleep study. Mm-hmm. And we found out that, you know, he did end up having sleep apnea. So, but what we saw with his blood work, we saw high levels of fasting insulin. They were, they were 10. We saw a C-reactive protein, that marker mm-hmm. for inflammation was mm-hmm. really high. Um, we saw that his, he had low levels of mm-hmm. vitamin D and we know vitamin D is critical for for so many things in our health, including insulin sensitivity. Um, we saw that his omega-3 fat levels, you can do it, uh, something called an omega quant, which looks at the amount of omega-3s in the red blood cell membrane. And we saw that his omega-3 levels were low. And we know that omega-3s are really important for resulting in you know, helping lower inflammation in the body. Mm-hmm. We can also do some special testing, uh, something called an organic acid testing. And we did that for him. And we saw that his mitochondria, which were which are the powerhouse of your cells, needed a lot more support. And one of the reasons that people develop uh, problems with with hunger and weight gain and insulin resistance is when mm. you with issues with their mitochondria. And we so we saw that we needed to really support yeah. that. He had yeah. high levels of, of free radicals or oxidative stress, and so there were a lot of things we needed to work on with him. Um, one of the first things we did is we got him his sleep apnea treated. He got a CPAP machine and he started to feel better right away. You know, patients resist this a mm. lot, but, but, you know, we see that when they, when they really do uh, jump on board and start using that CPAP machine and it's fitted right, many times they just feel so much better. Their energy is better. And one of yeah. the reasons, and their hunger decreases because that ghrelin decreases. Cause remember we said that if you have sleep deprivation or sleep apnea, your ghrelin is going to be higher and you're just going to, you're going to just be wanting to eat and eat and eat. So uh, that was one of the first things we really, really helped him do. And it really was very helpful for that, that, um, decreasing his hunger and that drive to just eat and eat. Um, 
We also really supported him nutritionally with uh, cutting way back on his carbohydrates, getting more vegetables in his diet, more nutrient dense foods. Um, we, we gave him some supplements that supported his mitochondria like CoQ10 and B mm. vitamins and alpha lipoic acid. And, um, mm. you know, and he did really well, you know, I mean, with some of these simple shifts, he started to lose weight after f- like six months, he got, you know, down to his ideal weight after about four months, his weight, waist to hip ratio got to 0. 0.9, which is really where we wanted to see it. And he just started feeling better and he was, um, having more energy and not hungry all the time. And he really understood what foods to choose. And then most importantly, from my perspective was that, you know, we just really decreased his risk of all sorts of diseases, right? Because we know that, that, that insulin resistance pattern drives heart disease and stroke and cancer and dementia and diabetes. And, um, you know, so we really, you know, that, that was really great that we were able to intervene at this age and, and I think help prevent a lot of diseases for him in the future. With people who are struggling with hunger and cravings, you know, I think one of the, one of the books that I really loved about this is called the always hungry by david ludwig who's a oh, that's brilliant. friend of ours brilliant book he's a harvard professor and he's really studied the biology of hunger and he showed that you know you can literally retrain the brain to not be hungry by regulating what you're eating by increasing fat protein decreasing starch of sugar timing eating when you're eating you know not eating late at night making sure you have a little period of, of, of fast snacking is probably the worst thing in the world <laughs> when you go to the grocery store i mean most of the food is snack food which is yes. crazy you know, and I, it's just like, I, I don't even go into those aisles, but it's mostly just snack food. And it's just striking to me how we've kind of gotten this culture of eating all the time and snacking and hunger and ups and downs. And, and it's something that we can really manage by addressing these underlying biological systems and, and, and paying attention to the simple daily rhythms that we need to follow in order to regulate our appetite. And then, you know, I, I just, I just, um, noticed in my own biology when i am dysregulated i get hungry i get cravings i want this i want that when i'm eating well and i'm eating whole foods and i'm giving myself the nutrients i need i don't i don't feel hungry i don't want i should have something before dinner i'll get all hungry that's fine or if i'm working out a lot i'll get all hungry but it's not this crazy oh i want to eat you know a muffin or i have to have something bad so i, th- I think there's a real so science of hunger and people really interested more in this topic i'd encourage them to read his book called always hungry He's got a great cookbook that goes along with it. But, you know, this is something we see all the time, Liz. We see so many people struggling with weight and with metabolism and hunger and cravings and, and, and feel, feel discouraged. But, it, you know, I, I found people literally within days can change quickly their biology and, and get rid of the craving, get rid of the hunger. I just remember this one woman who came to one of my workshops years ago on ultra metabolism, I think. And we basically put people on a, you know, really simple whole foods diet. We even broths and protein shakes and lots of vegetables and good quality protein, good fats. And she was like, look, I'm never going to be able to do this. I'm, I've been craving sugar my whole life. I have to eat it. I don't know what to do. I'm really worried about it. I'm so stressed. I'm like, look, just try it for a couple of days, see what happens. And, and the design of the program was really to design to regulate these hormones, to regulate the ghrelin and to regulate the insulin and to regulate the blood sugar and the brain chemistry. And within two days, she's like, I can't believe it. I don't have any cravings anymore. I don't want this. I don't want that. So she's like, so happy. And I I think people don't realize just how close they are to feeling good and get rid of all those. If you love that last video, you're going to love the next one. Check it out here. The language, what's called the trans kingdom communication system of how the microbiome talks to mitochondria and to our DNA was discovered. And it's, it's as big a discovery as